but you know I'm so deeply honored and so grateful to North Palm, every one of you that's made it, um, helped us to make this our home. I remember David MacDonald prophesying and confirming that God was gonna send us to another country. It would be different, different architecture, different food, um, and uh, we would be in a place where even the doctrine was different, and we had to come into the seven mountains and so on, and he said, but you'll know you belong. And uh, we feel that way today, amen. We're family, we're community, and we're, the brethren dwell together in unity. Here's where God commands his blessing. And so, Father, we're just so grateful that we can call you Father, that we can call you Abba, Abba Daddy. We're so grateful, Lord Jesus, that we can call you Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords, our master, our savior, our healer, our deliverer. Lord, the truth, the way to the Father and the truth and the life in the Father. We thank you, great Spirit of God, that you're able to and about to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. I thank you for the resurrection power in your people. And I thank you that once again today, it'll be activated with signs, wonders, and miracles. Every disease dissolves in your presence and is dissipated in the name of Jesus Christ. We give you all the glory in advance and Satan and demons in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ, we break your power. You loose in Jesus' name any captive today. Somebody in the area of the mind, you felt so captive, but in the name of Jesus Christ, there it goes. You're free. See, it cannot hold you in the name of Jesus Christ. Free in Christ, free indeed, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind, and you have allowed fear to come in. And the Lord would say, fear not, fear not, fear not, for I am with you, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never abandon you or let you down. And so know that because he has said in his word, if God be for us, who can be against us? No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now I am gonna save time because Apostle Mark just said it so beautifully in terms of the Holy Spirit being basically the mother in the Godhead, I believe. Jesus said, you touch the Father, you touch me, but if you touch Holy Spirit, there's no place of forgiveness, right? And so in that sense, I just loved what Apostle Mark was saying in the offering today, and I'm not gonna add to that other than to say we are a church that believe in supernatural mothers. Our first mother, Abraham's wife, supernaturally bore a child at the age of 90, Isaac, isn't that right? And we can go all the way down and watch God's supernatural protection as Jochebed had Moses, kept in the bulrushes. We go through to uh, <laughs> through the different mothers in the scriptures, Hannah crying out when she was barren, yet she cries out. Eli says, what are you doing in the house of the Lord drunk? She says, I'm not drunk, but I'm crying out for a child. I want a baby. And thank God I've seen God open barren wombs. I've seen God given people babies. I remember Willie Conradi one day in a prayer meeting came and I was actually at the altar. He came up to me and I said, but Willie, Patsy's gonna have a baby. The next thing she felt pregnant. Then we would have morning prayer meetings together, the two brothers and myself, Bernard Patu, Willie and myself. And I'm kneeling with them and I see two nappies on a line in vision. And I said, guys, your wives are gonna have babies. And both their wives fell pregnant. So in Jesus' name, Keep your faith out, beloved, because God is the God of the supernatural. The church is a supernatural church. This church is a supernatural mother. The church, the Bible tells us, when Zion, the church, travails, she gives birth to children. So the birthing has never stopped. And God wants us as a church to birth babies, to birth new converts. This whole revival is about allowing the Holy Spirit to overshadow us so that Christ can be born, hallelujah, in the hearts of men. Mary just said, and what a mother she was. Yeah, I just honor her. I was thinking the other day how we need to respect the mother Mary. I don't worship her as the mother of God, you understand, but I deeply revere her. In fact, she's no longer a virgin. You understand, she had other sons. But as the virgin, God came to this beautiful young Jewish woman and he said, you're gonna bear a child and uh, he will be savior of the world. And uh, she said, how can this be since I know not a man? He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he will overshadow you in that holy thing. That 
that will be born of you will be the Christ. Would you say Christ? Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the one who is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and the one that we know is uh, beyond anything that I can describe today. In fact, there's something I love, and it was Oral Roberts who shared when I was a young Christian, and he talked about Jesus in every book of the Bible. So we've come here today. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he took me to the fact that I'm called to the praise of his glory. Everything we do, whether we eat, drink, whatever we do, we do to the glory of God. If the church doesn't glorify God, we're in a mess. So we're not here to glorify man, let no flesh glory in his presence. And one of the reasons the Holy Spirit doesn't move like he wants to move is because we grieve him, you understand, by putting somebody in the place of him, Jesus. How do I know I'm in the Holy Ghost? Because I'm glorifying Jesus. He will not speak of himself, Jesus said. He will take of that which is mine and he will show it to you. He will glorify me. And so when we talk about revival, beloved, we want a church that glorifies Jesus. The Welsh revival with that young man, what happened was the whole thing was we just bow. The eye bowing into a sea for Christ. And so what the world are needing is Jesus Christ. Would you say Jesus Christ? Would you say the Lord Jesus Christ? He is King of kings, Lord of lords, and every knee shall bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, hallelujah. And it's the nails in His hands that cause Him to hold you the way He does. The nails through His feet, the spear in His side and the crown of thorns upon His head that caused His head to swell to twice the size. This Jesus paid and gave everything for you and everything for me so that you could become His treasure. And so beloved, you are His jewels and He's busy polishing you and polishing me to make up His jewels for that glorious day. He's preparing His bride that'll be without spot and without blemish as we stand before Him. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is working in us and working by the purification of the Word. He speaks His Word and you are clean through the Word which He speaks to prepare you as spotless so that you can come before Him blameless. And so I love the fact that Paul said, I travail again in birth. God is still birthing through His church. I travail again in birth until Christ is formed in you. What God is looking for is not Sam Stark. God is looking for Jesus Christ. He loves Sam Stark, you understand? And thank God He's made me one with Him and He's put a new heart and a new spirit in me. I have a spirit, not of fear, but one of power, love and a sound mind. We have the nature and the life of God, you understand, beloved. We're seated with Him in heavenly places, but He is still Lord of the throne, hallelujah. And He alone, must be revered and unto Him be the preeminence in the church. The moment I take glory to myself, I'm grieving the Holy Ghost. And so we, I believe as we're moving in this revival, God is bringing the fear of the Lord, the reverential awe of God to understand that we reverence God. We respect God. Hallowed be thy name. I think it was I heard the other day at the men's retreat, somebody talking about John Bevere saying when he comes to pray, he always stops and just hallows God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallowed be your name. I hallow your name. At that name, every knee shall bow and everything Jesus is is in that name because he said, in my name, you'll cast out devils, speak with new tongues. Uh, you'll drink, uh, if you drink any deadly thing, it'll not harm you. Hallelujah, you'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And as they went forth preaching, the Lord worked with them. Would you say the Lord is working with us? Would you say Jesus is here today? You come for a healing? I don't, I'm not a healer but there's a healer in the house. And he said, wherever two or three gather together in my name, there I'll be in the midst. I'm trying to get to my notes here, beloved, but just the way God's wired me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to preach deliverance to the captives, sent me to go recovery of sight to the blind. I've seen the blind see, to set at liberty those that are bruised. The Holy Ghost, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom, hallelujah. Total and absolute freedom, free in Christ and free indeed. No captivity, no prison house, 
because the Spirit of the Lord upon him came to open the prison door to the prison house. If you're in prison today with sickness or disease, if you're in prison with any habit, if you're in prison or imprisoned by any situation, Jesus is the door and the door is wide open. Through Christ you can come free. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. He fills my every longing. He keeps me singing as I go. Without Jesus, I would be dead in the water. Not only dead, I would actually be dead. He saved my life when I came to a place of wanting to finish my life. And He came and the next thing, the Holy Spirit put the blood out like lightning through my spirit, the blood of Jesus. I thought, Lord, what are you doing? This is the third time I'd anticipated finishing my life. And then the Lord came and He said to me, Son, I am your shepherd. I am your shepherd. And I will lead you and guide you and my rod and my staff, they'll protect me. Little did I know that he would restore what the canker worm, the locusts have eaten. He'd give me beauty for ashes and he would turn my situation, my mourning into laughter. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Beloved, he is no respecter of persons. He paid the same price for you as He paid for any other child of God. You are purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And this morning standing next to Apostle Mark, I got the word, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. I said to Apostle Mark, he will build North Palm Church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. God is as much for this church as any other church in the world. And so we are to do what the praise and worship team, oh, here go my notes, i forgetting. What they sang here today, what they sang, I, I tell you these songs they chose today. He is able, He is able, He is able, He is more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. He's never changed. He's the unchangeable, immortal, only wise God, the invisible God. Somebody comes to church and says, who's he talking about? I'm talking about the invisible God. I'm talking about the one that's here, hallelujah. And so Oral Roberts wrote that beautiful thing and they preached on the fourth of man in my baby Christian years. Did I love Oral Roberts? When I get to heaven, I'm gonna throw my arms around his neck for the part he played in my life. In Genesis, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of broken walls, the broken walls of our lives. In Esther, he's our advocate. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's the Lord, our shepherd, hallelujah. So we shall not lack, glory to Jesus. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our goal. In Song of Solomon, he's our lover and our bridegroom. In in Isaiah, he's the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he's the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man, Jesus. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the burning fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the eternal husband, forever married to the backslider. You can ask Apostle Keith and Angela about that. Forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's our savior. In Jonah, he's the great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, he's our avenger. In Habakkuk, he's an evangelist pleading for revival. In Zephaniah, he's the Lord mighty to save. In Haggai, he's the restorer of the lost heritage. In Jeremiah, glory to Jesus. In Jeremiah, uh, it jumped forward. So we'll just pick up in Zephaniah. He's the Lord mighty to save. In Haggai, he's the restorer of the lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's the fountain springing up with everlasting life. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness, risen with healing in his wings. 
In Matthew, he's the Messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. And in John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the Holy Ghost moving among men. In Romans, the justifier. First and second Corinthians, the sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. And in Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he's the God who supplies all our needs. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In first and second, in Thessalonians, our soon coming King. In first and second Timothy, he's the mediator between man and God. In Titus, he's the faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend of the oppressed. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the Lord who raises the sick. By the way, if you have any growths in your body, in Jesus' name, just release your faith. We command those lumps to dissipate. In the name of Jesus, just reach out to the Lord. He's here. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. He never left. I don't talk about Pentecost in terms of the name on somebody's church. I've been into some churches called Pentecost. I thought, where did Pentecost go? When I talk Pentecost, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit on the move. Amen. Church being multiplied and daily the Lord adding. James, he's the Lord who raises the sick. In First and Second Peter, he's the chief shepherd who soon shall appear. In First, Second, and Third John, he is love. In Jude, he's the Lord coming with ten thousand of his saints, in and thousands. In Revelation, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is Abel's sacrifice and Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram and Isaac's well. He's Jacob's ladder and Ezekiel's burden. He's Judah's scepter, Moses' rod, David's slingshot, and Hezekiah's sundial. He is the church's head and is risen from the dead. He is the husband to the widow and a father to the orphan. A husband to the widow and a father to the orphan. To those who travel by night, he's a bright morning star. And to those in the lonesome valley, that's you today. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Underneath are his everlasting arms. I'm talking to a mother here where you think your children have forgotten you. God has not forgotten you. And he'll cause the circle to not be broken. He knows how to bring them home. Hallelujah. In the lonesome valley, he's the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon, honey in the rock, and the staff of life. He's the pearl of great price, he rock in a weary land. He's counselor, everlasting father. And the government is upon his shoulders. He's Peter's shadow, John's pearly white city. He's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God. He's the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and even the cattle on North Palm's farm. He's the one who split the Red Sea. He's the one. <laughs> he's the one who took the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. He's the one who humbled himself, came to earth, healed the sick, raised the dead, cleansed the lepers, opened the eyes of the blind, and turned water to wine. Oh my! He's the one who fed the five thousand, walked on water, cast out devils. The one who humbled himself once again became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Oh, hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah. No wonder Paul said, no wonder Paul said, I want to know nothing amongst you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Glory, glory, glory. I want to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, when you go to Colossians chapter 1, you can read from verse 24 there. You'll find in 26, it talks about secrets. I said, I'm going to talk today on the secret things that belong to God. You know, when Jesus said, narrow is the way and few there be that find it, I've changed my thinking about that a little. It's not just the broad road that leads to destruction and narrow being the way of the Christian. It's about once you're in the Lord, there's a narrow way. He's that way. And the Holy Spirit will lead you in that way and make a way where there seems to be no way because He is the Spirit of revelation. He wants to fill you with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual uh, understanding so that you can have a walk worthy of Him, fully pleasing Him, so that you can be fruitful in every good work, so that He can strengthen you with His might and by His Spirit in the inner man. 
And so what I'm saying is you walk with God and as you walk in obedience, okay, the pathway of the righteous gets brighter and brighter. As you commit your way to the Lord, he directs your paths. As you commit your works to the Lord, your thoughts are established and God begins to renew your mind so that you can understand his word and see the things that already belong to you. I was praying the other day, so pressing in at the men's retreat and part of the service is part of that prayer. And uh, the Lord said, you've already got it. I thought, oh my goodness, I've heard that before. So I went to, I went to uh, <laughs> Deb's and I said, did Andrew Womack, how did he hear that word? The Lord said to me, you've already got it. Would you say I've already got it? That's a secret. To the natural mind, the things of the spirit are foolishness. The things of the spirit are foolishness to the natural mind. Last time I was here, I think, I spoke on the natural mind, the carnal mind, the mixture, and the spiritual mind, the mind of Christ. What I'm finding is that disobedient Christians can't see and hear what God wants them to see and hear. They never experience the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so, beloved, it's worth paying the price. He gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey and he shows the secret things that belong to him to man. And so you can go through the whole Old Testament and you will find that even when Jesus rose, he spoke about the Old Testament and showed them how he was mentioned in the the books of Moses, the Psalms and all the other books of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament concealed, but in the New Testament revealed. And so when we get to the New Testament, here's the disciples walking with Jesus and they still did not understand fully why Jesus had to go to the cross. Peter tried to stop him. After the Lord had said, the, the, when Jesus had asked, who do men say that I am? You will know that he said, thou art the Christ. And Jesus says, well, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father, and the same chapter, he's telling Jesus not to go to the cross and Jesus has to say, get thee behind me, Satan, because you savor not the things of God. What I'm saying, beloved, is even the disciples that walked with Jesus, that could touch him, that could feel his beard, John that lay on his bosom at the Last Supper, did not know the things that God was about to reveal. And Apostle Mark mentioned it today, the Holy Spirit has come to reveal Hallelujah, and to show us. And so this apostle Paul is a prophet, apostle born out of time. God begins to take him into the back of the desert for three years, then another 14 years, 17 years in all, to show him that Christ is the Messiah. This man could quote the Old Testament. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. You understand, which was like the university of the day. And yet he needed the Holy Spirit to knock him off his horse. He needed a personal revelation of Jesus Christ. He needs scales to fall from his eyes so that he could know the mysteries of God, the secret things that belong to God. I'm telling you, beloved, I've been on this road a long time. I've been in the ministry over 40 years and I'm still feeling like a little baby in the kingdom. And God's still revealing truths to me that are more precious than gold. His, His word is like silver tried seven times, purified. Understand there's things in God that are so precious. And throughout all eternity, we'll be getting to know this Jesus, not only as Lord and Savior and Master and Healer and Deliverer, but in terms of all His different attributes. And so he, if you look at Colossians 1, I'm not gonna read the scriptures because of time. Please look at Colossians 1, 26, 27. You'll see that God has now made known the mystery, which is Christ in you. Hallelujah, the hope of glory. Many a Christian, when they read that, don't even know what it means. The hope of glory, is that just heaven? That's part of it, beloved, but it's a lot more than that. It's like the Bible says, man sinned and fell short of the glory. It's like the archer who shoots the arrow, but it falls short. They don't hit the target. In fact, archers used to call uh, missing the target sin. If you missed with your arrow, it was called sin. And where Christians miss the mark is number one, they're not even aiming at the right target. When we talk about the right target, beloved, it's the glory. 
And what is the glory? It's the manifest presence of Jesus and all His attributes and everything He can do. Everything the Holy Spirit wants to show us, understand, beloved, and wants to do. When I get into the presence of God's glory, I see things that I couldn't see any other way. My spirit comes alive and I see with my spiritual eyes, which I couldn't do before I was born again. And so what we have is the Christian falling short or (laughs) aiming in a skew way. And so what's my Christian life about? It's about glorifying Jesus. It's about manifesting His glory. For we beheld His glory full of grace and truth. He is the express image of God. And when the church, understand, looks like Jesus, we would have arrived. Now already your spirit man is like Jesus. You've already got it. You're born again, Ephesians 4.24 says, of true righteousness and holiness. But I wanna say this to you, beloved, it's like a glove. God will not live in a dirty house. They had to prepare that tabernacle temple. They went to incredible lengths to make sure, even with the temple, you couldn't hear the sound of a hammer. Because God is very, very concerned about where he lives. But now he's come to live in you and me. And the only way he could do that is to create a new heart, a new spirit. Now you have a spirit of righteousness and true holiness. And so you've already got it. As he is, so are we in the world. And you can operate out of that spirit of life, that spirit of power, that spirit of a sound mind. You understand? However, I want to add something to this. I want you to get this because the average Christian is not understanding that their spirit has just been developed, if you like, so that God can live in them and through them. And so what we've got is Christians frustrated. And this is what breaks my heart from a pastoral point of view. Let me not, it breaks my heart when I see a a girl who can't find a husband and nobody's told her how to become sweet enough. I know because my daughter Bonnie married the right one. God has wisdom. God knows how to do these things. And Christians are missing it often because they're not looking to the spirit in there. I listen to my heart, to the voice of the spirit inside me. You see, it's not just that I'm a new creation, it's that the creator lives in me. Corrie ten Boom said it this way, it's like a hand and a glove. So what God is wanting to do, beloved, is He is living in you. He wants to not just visit, He dwells in you. Ephesians 3 prayer says that He may dwell in our hearts through faith. You understand, He wants to live, all right? But then He doesn't want to just be in the guest room. He wants to be actively involved. The hand must move in the glove. And so whatever he says, we do it. You try and put on a glove. I know the, if the glove doesn't fit, you must have quit. It was a big case here. If the glove don't fit, you understand. And Jesus says, Holy Spirit, bring me the right glove. <laughs> and the Lord says, that one's the right one because she's born again. That's a born again mother. Oh, shaka bundi. That's a supernatural mother. That's a virtuous woman. And her husband will sit with the elders in the gate. Read Proverbs 31. Well, I don't need it. Oh, come on, Lord. I just, I'm just going to be obedient if you're all are happy with that. Whenever you see women in the Bible, it's a type of churches or false churches. When you go through Proverbs, you can see it there. The virtuous woman is the anointed woman, the church of Jesus Christ, glorified. Hallelujah justified and glorified is the church. If we had to see each other's spirits here, we'd need special sunglasses because of how you shine and what God has done in you. Now your outer man, the soul is being renewed to understand and grasp these things and the body has to be kept under so that we can now walk in it. The problem is this, the Christian says, you know what, Lord, I'm coming to your supermarket. I call it, I've given it a new name, the supermarket syndrome. The supermarket syndrome is the Christian going and saying, you know what, I need some love, God. Will you give me some love? And then they imagine the Holy Spirit or the angels coming with a big tube like toothpaste and going. (laughs) And then you know what, God, I need some joy. And then they go to another shelf in the God's supermarket and they get a big bottle of joy. Looks like bubble bath, right? Champagne, if you like. And then they're gonna, (laughs) in goes the bubbly, bubbly. Or they want power, so now they think the angels come with a big stick and stick it in, boy, and kaboom, the power's there. 
When the truth is this, beloved, God is not about commodities. God gave, if you miss everything else I said today, because this is the, the heart of our message, or the Lord's message, I believe, to his church. He gave you himself. Would you say greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world? Oh, my, my, my. So you've done it again, Sam. You've done it again. You've done it again. What have you done again? You've shot the clock. <laughs> I want to honor your time. Jesus said of myself, I can do nothing. He said, what you sing is the Father working in me. Then he said in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. So if you'll allow me to live in you and through you, and the Bible tells us this. So I wrote this out because I find it so beautiful. Listen to this. It is to be a release of the Holy Spirit within us that we might live the life of Jesus Christ, producing the character of Jesus Christ and reflecting the likeness of Jesus Christ in all we do. It is to be the release of the Holy Spirit within us that he might live the life of Jesus Christ, producing the character of Jesus Christ and reflect the likeness of Jesus Christ in all we do. Reinhard Bonk said it this way, I'm just a riverbed. There comes a time when we submit, Paul said we die daily. How do I die daily? When my will crosses God's will. I choose not my will, but thy will be done. And he increases and I decrease. And I allow my spirit man, the new created spirit to take the ascendancy over my soul, my mind and my emotions. Emotions are, des are dangerous because when desire has conceived, it brings forth sin and sin brings death. I let the person, would you say the person? So would you say, Lord Jesus, you are Lord. You live within me and I give you total control of my spirit, my soul, my body, my relationships and my finances. I submit and yield to you, Holy Spirit, like a riverbed, like a glove I am to your hand so that you can move through me in power. I yield myself to you so that you can work through me in your wisdom. What the Lord said is this, he said in 1, 1 Corinthians 1 24, Christ, the power of God and Christ, the wisdom of God. That's why Paul said in chapter two, he says, I wanna know nothing amongst you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He just finished saying the Lord chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. The base things, the things that men despise. God has chosen. And he's put us, beloved, because I qualified on that one. Ask my wife. I ticked all the boxes. But he's chosen us to reveal his son in us. And God has put us, put you in Christ, who has made unto you wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Would you say, I have no lack? I've already got it. As he is, so am I in my spirit, man. Now I'm allowing my spirit man to rule over my emotions, over my thoughts. I cast down every thought and I choose to think on whatsoever things are true, noble, pure, righteous, praiseworthy. Say this, I set my mind on the things in heaven, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. Listen to me, beloved, get this. He saved you. You couldn't save yourself. You can't keep yourself. So he said, I'm not just the author of your faith. Look to Jesus. I'm the finisher, the perfecter of your faith. The Bible says it's God who works in you. Philippians 2.13, to will and to do of his good pleasure. You God's workmanship. I couldn't save myself. Give me a break. I was an accident looking for somewhere to happen. 
but He came and saved me. And what I didn't get, beloved, is I thought, oh, well, now that I'm saved, now I must open the Bible and look for all the commodities, ask for love, ask for joy, ask for all these things, and that would work. And God had to come and say, no, son, you've already got it. I am your life. I am your peace. I am your joy. Now, what I need you to do is come to me and look to me. We've heard Apostle Mark saying this over and over. Jesus said, come to me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The priesthood was not to perspire. And too many Christians are perspiring, wondering why there's a sweat in the camp. God had no perspiration in His presence because they're trying to do it themselves. Who has bewitched you? Says Paul to the Galatians. Having begun in faith, are you perfected by works? Don't be bewitched. That's witchcraft. Manipulating you with false doctrine. That's what the devil does to deceive you. He says, we receive the Holy Spirit's supply and the working of miracles amongst us, Galatians 3, 5, by His miracle power. So wherever you are, would you just look to Jesus right now? Say, Jesus, I'm aiming my arrow, my life. I want to be a straight arrow. And I'm aiming my arrow to have you fully formed in me so that you will be seen through me. Now, would you say this? I live, nevertheless not I, but Christ lives in me. Let's say it again. I live, nevertheless not I, but Christ lives in me. Jesus, I live, nevertheless not I, but you live in me. You are the power of God. You are the wisdom of God. And I have perfect knowledge of every situation because your anointing in me shows me what to do. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm yours.